Hello, everyone, and welcome to Midday Mindfulness. Wherever you're viewing from, wherever you're tuning in from, you belong here, so please stay. I'm Dr. Nika Gwechi, and I am here with my team, Dr. Terry Pipe, Hannah Layton, Jackie Spear, and today we are joined by a very special knowledge share, Dr. Sophia Town. And together, along with all of you, is our community. We are the Center for Mindfulness, Compassion, and Resilience at Arizona State University. We have Miss Molly joining us in the background here today. So at Center, we aim to make the definition and practice of mindfulness as equitable, accessible, and easily understandable as possible. So mindfulness then is simply a presence in the moment with intention, with awareness, in order for all of us to live a deeper and more meaningful life. So let's define these three words, mindfulness, compassion, and resilience. Each one was chosen specifically for what it embodies uh, and for what our values are here at ASU and at Center. Mindfulness is an intentional presence in the moment, a non-judgmental presence in the moment. And that judgment um, is meaning of self and of other. So non-judgmental towards both ourselves and other people. Uh, mindfulness is a practice that has been used throughout many religions, traditions, cultures. And you might have practiced mindfulness without even defining it as such. Some uh, may practice mindfulness when creating art or making food, for example. And then compassion. Compassion is simply a kindness to self and to others. So we as a community of which you're all part are working to build a culture of compassion and caring here at Arizona State University and throughout the world, really. Our main mission here at Center is to change the world, and we do so with the deep value of compassion. And then resilience. Resilience is not simply a bouncing back from adversity, from challenges, because we're not going backwards. We're not going back to the way that things were, the way that we were before a trauma or a stressful experience. We're actually moving forward. And if we bring in resilience, we come back stronger and more adaptable to change than we were before the trauma or the stress. We can build skills through mindfulness and through compassion that will make us more resilient in the face of stress, either before the stressor, during the stressor, or afterwards as a resilience strategy. So mindfulness, compassion, and resilience are our values here at Center and at ASU. Last week, we were joined by Evelyn Brown, who was a recent ASU alumnus, and she joined us for our community well-being session on Thursday. She sent us two poems as a follow-up. So today, I'll read them as a way for us to get centered before getting into our topic at hand. So let's get into a comfortable position. If you're on Zoom, you can turn off your cameras. And if you're watching from home or on the archive version, um, you can get into a comfortable space. Close your eyes if you like. Sit down with your back upright, away from the chair, shoulders away from ears, crown of the head reaching towards the ceiling. And taking a moment to find your breath, finding your inhale and your exhale, noticing when your inhale starts and when your exhale ends. Always knowing that you can come back to the breath, but it is free that it is always here for you. Your breath is your anchor and your home. So keeping your eyes closed or a soft downward facing gaze, I'll read these two poems for you for reflection. 
The first poem is from a book called The Seven Paths. Is it just a coincidence that the creations that provide the most help happen to be the most beautiful? I think not. For I have known people who provide service after the manner of plants, and their lives have been the most beautiful lives I have known. And the next poem is Evelyn Brown's response to that poem, and it's called The Sanctity of All Creation. Watercress on the little stream, piled like green coins, pure, selfless, and invaluable service. I hope to follow in its path. I peered into my reflection on the water, but I didn't see myself. I only saw the plants, the sky, and the creatures. Spring pollen showered over us. My whole being felt light and cleansed. Coming back now to your inhale and your exhale. Noticing peace, noticing lightness. If your eyes are closed, then please gently open them, wiggling your fingers and your toes, taking any light stretches of the neck or the arms that you would like. Thank you for practicing with me today. And thank you, Evelyn, for your beautiful words. So now it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce my dear friend, Dr. Sophia Town. She is a professor, researcher, and wisdom seeker. Her research focuses on leadership and human flourishing in the context of an increasingly complex world. Yeah, no kidding. This work reflects an interdisciplinary spirit drawing on social science and spirituality to make sense of human phenomena and address pressing leadership problems. Dr. Town's current projects explore how leaders and organization members navigate complexity with wisdom and insight. Central topics include discursive leadership, emotion, organizational paradox, and mindfulness. As an educator, her classes are guided by the question, how can we use business education to develop compassionate leaders and build a flourishing world? These courses are grounded in a transformational pedagogy, including critical reflexivity, experiential learning, and mindfulness-based approaches, which aims to move students from knowing to becoming. In addition to her professional role, she serves as a research consultant for ASU Center for Mindfulness, Compassion, and Resilience, and a research fellow for the International Humanistic Management Association. Her work has been supported by the Lincoln Center for Applied Ethics and the Transformation Project. In 2018, Dr. Town was named the Jean Lind Herberger Fellow for Transformative Scholarship. Welcome, Dr. Town. We're so thrilled to have you here today. And for those of us joining on our live stream, then please feel free to ask questions, engage in the chat. And if you're watching the archive version and you have questions or comments, you can always email us at mindfulness.asu.edu. So welcome, Dr. Town. Thank you. Thank you so very much for having me. Um, I think this is the third or fourth time that I've joined for one of your midday mindfulness um, sessions. And I was talking to my husband about this earlier. I tend to use, I don't know if you know this, but I tend to use these sessions to share kind of my most recent scholarship um, in, in a public way. And so I always, I love everyone at the center. I love all the work you're doing. You already know this, but I'm just sharing this for the, for the anyone who knew who's, who's watching. Um, the work you do is fantastic. And 
I think something about generative work and good work is that it encourages um, others to sort of step into the task and step up and and do better work. So you've encouraged me to create new 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 work um, that uh, I'm eager to share. So thank you so much. Okay, so let me share my screen real quickly. Get my Zoom technology going. Okay, are you able to see my full screen slides? Fantastic. All right. Okay, so today I wanted to share a bit about this idea of mindful communication. Um, communication is always an important topic. It's something that's vital to personal and professional and relational flourishing. But right now in the midst of this past year with the pandemic and you know, working from home and feeling isolated and you know, connecting via technology more than face-to-face, -face, the idea of communication and um, understanding what mindful communication looks like is even more relevant and important than it ever has been before. And so I'd like to dive into that topic today. So this workshop school has basically four parts. Um, I'm gonna start off by talking about why we need mindful communication. Other than, I think we all kind of have like a gut feeling and understanding that, that mindful communication is important, but why do we need it now? And then the second thing we'll talk about is how do we actually do it? It's, it's communication, something that people tend to think of as common sense, but when we really get down to it and look at what's the difference between, you know, communication that helps us get through our day and communication that really like contributes to our flourishing, there's a big difference. So we'll talk about what that looks like. Then we'll talk about what gets in the way of mindful communication, because that is critical. We definitely have obstacles between where we are now and being able to um, communicate in a way that's, that's mindful. And then we'll do a, an exercise where we put it into practice. And then we'll take questions at the end. Okay, so you don't need me to tell you this, but we are experiencing a loneliness epidemic in our society. Um, college students, I know as being a professor, college students are lonelier than ever before. That's been sort of the case on the rise, but with the pandemic, it's even worse. People yearn for connection at work, at school, at home, we strive to connect but oftentimes we're left feeling depleted and socially anxious. And given the fact that so much of our communication is happening through these mediated technologies these days in particular, that social anxiety and depletion is increasing. And so we need to figure out a way to, to mitigate that and um, connect with others on a, a deeper level. The pandemic has amplified those effects specifically because our days now, our work days, our home days, are structured around separateness. So even you know this, you know this just like I do, even our happy hours now happen over Zoom, right? Everything happens over Zoom. And so the pandemic has just increased the problem, but it was already a problem. So one of the ways that we can treat this epidemic of loneliness is through mindfulness and mindful communication. So Nika, Dr. Guachi did a really wonderful job describing mindfulness and defining it. Um, the, the short definition I like to use is very similar to hers. So my definition, the definition I draw on is mindfulness is a special type of awareness characterized by noticing what's unfolding in front of us in the present moment with intention, curiosity, as opposed to judgment, and then a beginner's mind. So when we're thinking about mindfulness and why it's such an excellent tool, an important tool for creating deeper connection, I kind of want you to step back and think about mindfulness as, um, think about two types of mindfulness practice. So mindfulness pr can be practiced formally, like in ter terms of meditations, right? Which we just did earlier, five, a few minutes ago. You sit down on your couch, on your bed, on your chair, you practice mindfulness formally. Um, mindfulness can also be practiced more informally, sort of as needed during your day-to-day, -day, right? And, and also Dr. Guachi talked about this as well. So you can practice mindfulness when you're walking, eating, working. Um, 
or communicating. And what's really beautiful about communication as a context to practice mindfulness is it, it not only does it allow us to really practice what we're practicing on the cushion because now we're engaged in, you know, sometimes hearing things we don't like to hear or, you know, being in, in, in interaction with someone that makes us uncomfortable or excites us or there's all this kind of rich, juicy context that we can practice our mindfulness when we're interacting with other people. But the other thing that makes mindful communication such a beautiful context for this practice is that when we are able to really tap into our mindfulness when communicating with other people, we are able to create mutual well being. So we're able to give them something that lifts them up and through that giving, lift ourselves up. And so there's this, this opportunity here for really creating deep connection that enlivens us. And we'll go into that a little bit deeper through at the, uh, a little bit later in this, in this workshop. So what is mindful communication? Um, I, I kind of mentioned this, but if, if loneliness is the epidemic, then mindful communication is a treatment, not the only treatment, and mindfulness, paying attention in that particular way, is the delivery system. So I know there's a bunch of people in medical and nursing, uh, the medical and nursing fields around here, so please pardon the total like simplicity of that metaphor, but I like to think of mindfulness as a tool. Okay, so one thing else I wanna kind of get off the table when it comes to mindfulness is we often think of it as an individual personal practice, especially in Western society, but really mindfulness is more of a social practice than its name implies. So when we practice mindfulness, we are actually affecting other people, even if we are practicing it as an individual, because it kind of seeps out and of us and it, you know, the energy can be transferred, emotional contagion, right, to other people. Okay, so how do we do mindful communication? We talked about what mindfulness is, what mindful communication is, why it's important. How do we actually do it? So I'll share three kind of little easy, quick, you know, tips or tricks that you can put into practice today. And then we're gonna dive into one um, a little bit more richly. So the first thing you can do to practice mindful communication, and this is super, super simple, is you can use the word you more often. And this seems kind of maybe like common sense, but we actually are in a culture that prioritizes um, and kind of idolizes I statements, feeling statements. In fact, in a lot of our conflict communication courses at you know, university that I've taught, we tell people, you know, when you're in interaction, use I statements. I feel this way. This makes me feel this way. And there is a time and place for that type of um, framing that can be productive to take sort of responsibility over our, our, our framing that way. But using the word you significantly more often than using I or me really contributes to, to making another person feel important and lifted up. And so I actually tell my students to practice, practice this um, over email. So when my, I teach you know, at the business school at Fordham University and a lot of my students are like asking me, how do I network? How do I make connections? How do I you know, reach out and find a mentor. I get those types of questions a lot. And one thing I always tell them is an email, use the word, start the email saying, hello, I'll, I'll use Nika. Hi, Nika. I believe you are the perfect person for me to talk to. I believe you are the person I'm looking for. And I say, go back and count them and make sure you use you more. And it sounds kind of strategic and manipulative, but it's actually not. It's the way we should communicate with other people to make them feel important. Okay, so that's one, easy. The second one is ask awkward questions. And the reason that, that we say awkward questions instead of just ask questions is that oftentimes what stops us from inquiring, from coming to a conversation in a mode of inquiry instead of advocacy or in a mode of questioning instead of knowing, one of the things that stops people um, from doing that is feeling like they're not gonna ask the right questions, not wanting to seem like they're prying not wanting to seem like an interrogator. And so, and essentially that can kind of manifest as shyness, right? But what research shows is that people, and you've probably heard this in, in terms of, you know, um, you've probably heard this from people in the past, but research does show that we love talking about the intricacies of our lives. Now I get to decide as the person, you know, answering the question, whether or not I want to, how much I want to disclose. 
but it's not up to the questioner to decide how much the person wants to disclose. So you always err on the, always can err on the side of asking more questions to make the other person, again, feel important and uplifted. And mindful communication isn't only about making the other person feel important and uplifted, but when we operate in that way, when we come to interactions with that sort of way of being, we generate something that's really beautiful and it comes back to us. And we role model that behavior for other people so that they can kind of see what it looks like and what it feels like to be uplifted through communication by another person. So ask awkward questions. The third one is notice your own judgments. So this one's kind of challenging and then play when, uh, mental whack-a-mole. <laughs> so what I mean by this is um, it is human nature to in any inter interaction, any time you're communicating with another person, it is human nature to assess pretty much everything the other person says. Now, this is really obvious when we're in some sort of debate, right? or we're having a conversation with someone that shares a different um, religious philosophy or political belief, right? It's very obvious that we sort of are assessing and judging what they're saying. And, but what we aren't so aware of, because it happens on such a subconscious level, is that we actually assess almost everything anybody says all of the time. And how this often shows up is this very, very quick little assessment we make in our, in our head, but again, like below our level of awareness, I agree or disagree. We do it like that. So if someone says, you know, oh, I'm going on vacation next year and my favorite place in the world is Hawaii, right? Something just as innocuous and, and simple as that. You, whether you have recognized it or not, and I, we all do this, we make this little assessment. I like Hawaii, or oh, I don't like Hawaii. Or oh, my mom loves Hawaii. I've never been to Hawaii. I don't think I'd like it. I think I'd love it. We do this very, very, very quickly. And when you start paying attention, you'll notice, oh my goodness, we, I do this all the time. It's not inherently bad. It's just sort of the natural way our brains work. But what, it can, what can happen is if we are unaware of those assessments um, because they're habitual, we miss, can miss an opportunity to really tune in to the other person and empathically understand where they're at. If we're constantly, if we're always sort of experiencing them behind our own lens of very natural assessments that we make. So one thing you can do, I, I give this um, assignment out to uh, my, my students, um, is practice this with other people. So next time you're in conversation, notice your assessments, which often again, show up as like or don't like, agree or disagree, and then play mental whack-a-mole with them. So just kind of like notice, oh, there's one, there's one. And that will make you present to how often they show up, which again, you can't stop them, but becoming aware of them sort of helps loosen us from that way of, um, of interacting. The other thing you can do if it's really challenging is uh, do this with a TV show. So put on a fav favorite TV show of yours, whatever you'd like to, you know, to watch. Could be the news, that's easy. Could be The Bachelor, I don't know. Whatever you like to watch, put it on and then notice yourself, set a timer for 10 minutes and see how often you can notice your assessments popping up. When we can release our assessments, we're better um, empathizers. So those are the three kind of like quick little tips and tricks. The fourth one, which we're gonna dive into uh, and really dive into, so put your goggles on, we're gonna jump in, is practicing generous listening. And generous listening is something that is truly a superpower. It's truly a human superpower and can create really beautiful things in the world. And so we'll talk about what this looks like. Beautiful things for you and for the people that you interact with. So typically speaking, when we think about different listening types, um, in my background, I'm at the business school at Forum now. My PhD is in organizational communication. So I have a communication background and I taught about, I taught listening a lot um, in the courses that I would teach when I was getting my PhD. And when we talk about listening, um, we're really looking at four different types, generally speaking. So the first type of listening is informational listening. And this is listening to learn. So um, you're listening informationally if you're you know, asking your friend how to cook a new recipe, or you ask someone for directions, or you're reading a textbook, 
that's listening to learn, right? Or I guess listening to a textbook, right? That's listening to learn, just absorb the info. The second is critical listening. This is listening to evaluate. So this we do a lot more often than we realize, but you can kind of imagine when this probably shows up, when you're in an argument with a friend, when you're watching the news, something like that. Talking to someone, deciding whether or not you're gonna be persuaded, talking to a salesperson, then you're listening in an evaluative way. A third is appreciative listening. This one's very pleasant and fun because it's easy. So you're listening um, to enjoy. This is where you're listening to music, you're, you're, you're at your favorite concert, you're listening to a podcast you love or a talk show, or you're, someone told a funny joke, you know, you're at a comedy show, or you're just totally engrossed in the conversation and, and drinking it up, right? That's lis listening um, in an appreciative way. And the fourth is empathic listening. And this is listening to understand. And this is when you do try to sort of release those assessments and judgments and really see what would it feel like to be this other person? You know, what, what, what would it be like to be in their shoes? Now, empathic listening is wonderful. It's so important and it's absolutely kind of like the, in the right direction. It's where we wanna go, but it doesn't stop there. Empathic listening is not the deepest kind of listening that we can do. And I think that's a misconception out there in, in the world and it might contribute that lack of awareness around a deeper level of listening might contribute to a lack of depth in our relationships and in our communication. So there's a fifth type of listening. The fifth type of listening is what I call generous listening. And this is listening to enliven other people. Enlivening is basically giving life to something. Enlivening is healing something. And when we enliven, we basically send a generous and generative energy to the other person. And what's interesting about this idea of enlivening others through our communication, I touched on this a little bit earlier, but when we listen in this way, it doesn't deplete us. It's not like I have a certain bank of energy and I, when I listen in a way that enlivens other people, mine's depleted. That can happen and I'll, I'll, we'll get into that. But generally speaking, when you enliven somebody else, the idea of enlivenment is that it's mutually reinforcing. You also fill yourself up. And so it, it, it's both, it's symbiotic. When we, can, when we enliven others, we contribute to their flourishing and our own flourishing as well. So what does generous listening look like? How do you do it? So generous listening is a type of listening that attends to and supports people's three basic psychological needs. So we all have a psychological need for autonomy, which is the ability to choose freely and have control in our own lives. We have a psychological need for competence, which is the ability and capability to achieve goals and enact change. And we have a psychological need for relatedness, which is a need to connect with other people. And psychologists Dusty and Ryan discovered these three psychological needs years ago and have found through research over the years, incredible research, that these needs are not only psychological, but they are basic, meaning they are fundamental, they are foundational. We need them in order to flourish and they are universal. So everybody shares these psychological needs. Now, how people come to them are different. I might, um, I might fulfill my psychological need for autonomy differently than somebody else, but we all have it. So for example, you might fulfill your, uh, your psychological need for autonomy by, um, putting everything on your Google calendar, right? It might make you feel like you're in control. You might fulfill your psychological need for competence by, or it might be fulfilled by um, being really good at a sport or a hobby or an instrument or being a good writer or being organized. You might fulfill your psychological need for relatedness or it might be fulfilled um, uh, environmentally, um, contextually by a really deep relationship you have with somebody or by being part of a like bocce ball community or a bowling club. So it can be, you can achieve the, these different states of um, need satisfaction different ways, but we all share these three. So listening in a generous way is listen, listening that actually supports other people in the fulfillment of these three psychological needs. So how you, pract how you can practice generous listening is in an interaction with another person, in an inter interaction with communication interaction with another person. 
you can contribute to their psychological need for autonomy by listening with the listening, sorry, from a place of you matter and your choices are important. So coming into that interaction from a place of you matter, that other person, and your choices are important. You can help people or fulfill people, uh, contribute to the fulfillment of other people's psychological need for competence by listening from a place of, you've done it before and I know you can do it again. So coming into that interaction from that, with that energy, with that philosophy. And then finally, relatedness, you can help support people's psychological need for relatedness by coming into an interaction from a place of, I am here for you and I am here with you. Now just take a second and think about, have you ever had someone listen to you like this? Have you ever had someone listen to you in a way that made you feel like you mattered and your choices were important? Like you've done it before, so they knew you could do it again. And like they were there with you and they were there for you. When people show up to interactions from that frame with that energy, it's healing. It makes us feel alive, flourishing. It fulfills our well being, right? Now, it's not that person's full responsibility to do this, but this is obviously, but this is a way of being that if, think about if everybody or if more of us, at, you know, showed up com to conversations in this way, how impactful that would be, as opposed to the other evaluative listening. You know, informational listening. And so generous listening, this is how, how you can practice. Um, also think about if you know anybody in your personal life that does this regularly, what you might find is that, um, I, and I, I, I have a, a hunch here that this is probably ha more often than not, but it's not researched yet. So I'm not gonna say it's a fact, I'll say it's a hunch. But I think what we will find is that highly charismatic people actually listen like this or in a way similar to this. These are the people that make you feel like the only person in the room, right? That when you're around them, you leave feeling better than when you, and before you met up with them. So there's something in there listening that's different. And again, that's my hunch. So we'll come back to that later. Stay tuned. <laughs> so. It's also really important um, so that we're not so hard on ourselves because self-compassion is so critical for personal development um, and self-judgment can stifle personal development. Um, we need to understand why we don't listen generously because if you found yourself thinking, oh my goodness, I don't ever do that, that's very normal. So please, please don't worry about that. That is very normal. Um, and actually when I, I, like in doing this work, I noticed how much opportunity I have to be better at this and do more of this. So it's very, very, very normal. But why we don't listen generously, there's five key reasons that um, that are probably present in most interactions and where this doesn't happen. Um, the first is we're in that habit of evaluative listening. That's the most frequent, the most common. Um, we're also in a habit of informational listening and because, because we are distracted and we're on autopilot, right? So this is about mindful communication. So mindfulness kind of brings us out of that autopilot, out of that distraction, out of that evaluative listening because we are self-aware and we notice it, right? So mindfulness can help with those first two. Um, but yeah, evaluative listening and the second, we're distracted. The third, we don't experience it much from other people. And so if our tank isn't full, it's really hard to give to other people, right? I mentioned earlier that enlivening other people isn't, depleting, it doesn't have to be depleting. Well, that's not gonna be the case if we feel totally drained to, be, to, to, to begin with, to start out. When we feel totally, if we feel totally drained in that interaction, which this last year has obviously caused a lot of drainage <laughs> for many of us, right? A lot of burnout, a lot of, and so to, to, to really practice generous listening, you have to take care of yourself first, right? So don't just go around thinking, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna try to heal the world through generous listening um, when you need to be, you know, um, thoughtful and mindful of your own of your own well-being. So go take a bubble bath first, first meditate, you know, play with your dogs, um, go do whatever makes you feel like you have something to give as the starting place. 
but we don't experience it much from other people. The second piece of that is um, we don't have a lot of role models for this kind of listening. Not only are we not receiving it, we're not watching other people do it very often. And so, and, and human beings are mirroring creatures. And so we very much kind of copy the connotations and mannerisms of those, those around us. If we don't have great role models, it's not, it's not our fault. We just would never have learned how to do this, right? That's the third. The fourth, we're self-conscious. So if you think back to the earlier slide on um, asking awkward questions, the reason we call them awkward questions is because sometimes we feel like any question asking is awkward, right? We, just, we feel like we don't wanna interrogate people. Well, what happens in conversations is um, that can hinder us from listening in an empathic way or a generous way, or even an appreciative way, honestly, is that we're oftentimes concerned about how we're listening. So it's kind of a paradox. We're concerned with, am I asking the right questions? Is my face doing the right thing? You know, am I, am I smiling? If this is a happy story, do I look concerned enough? If it's a sad story? I mean, it sounds, it, it, it's kind of a hard pill to swallow, but many people do this in interactions, especially, especially if we sp we're spending all this time now on Zoom, right? And so, and in fact, this is just kind of a side tangent, but I recommend, I really recommend to people um, to hide your self view when you're on Zoom. So you're not worried about what your face is doing because that can be very distracting and get in the way of our listening, even though it's behind a mediated um, uh, platform. But so we're self-conscious, okay? But when we kind of can learn and understand and buy into the fact that we, if we give to other people, they're gonna be more focused on the, what we're giving them and how we're making them feel than you know, if we're smiling the appropriate level or if we look concerned enough or, you know what I mean? And so um, generous listening, practicing it actually can really help decrease self-consciousness um, in our listening if we practice it over the long haul. Okay. And then the fifth is most probably the most important, we don't know how, <laughs> right? We don't know how. And so that's where using the three psychological needs as a framework for how to show up to an, to an interaction the intention of supporting those needs and other people can be really important. Now, one thing, I'll, another thing I'll say quickly is that, and I had this on the past slide, but I glazed over it. I forgot to mention it. Um, generous listening is a practice. It is a practice. And so you do not have to get it right. You don't have to remember to say particular things. Um, you don't have to say those three quotes on the other page. You can. I think those quotes are really productive things to say to people to make them feel enlivened, but you don't have to say them specifically. You, it's an energy that you bring to the interaction. And then also, you don't have to um, hit all three psychological needs in every interaction. Sometimes people will need more. They'll need to feel competent in that day, at that moment in time, right? They're really struggling with feeling like they're good enough, they're doing well enough, you know, their self efficacy is low. And in that interaction, if you come to an interaction with the, with the, the intention to, to support their competence, their need for competence, that, what, that's what's needed in that moment, that will be enough. And on other days, it might be a, a need for autonomy or a need for relatedness and connection. So it's more about practicing this way of being in interactions than hitting all of the, the checkpoints and making sure you're doing everything all at once, because that's just too much pressure and none of us can, can probably do that. <laughs> Okay, so now we're gonna put it into practice. So we'll start with ourselves. We'll start by connecting with ourselves because this is a really good way to understand what fulfillment of these needs feels like, okay? So what I'd like you to do is grab a pen and a uh, piece of paper, please. And just take a minute. If you need a, a sec to go grab something, you don't need anything bigger than probably a, a post-it note. So or a piece of scratch paper, whatever you have handy. But this will really be more impactful if you do write, if you do the exercise with us and write this down. So give yourself the opportunity to, to grab a, a piece of paper. Okay, so what, what I'd like you to do now is write down one thing in your life, just one thing, an activity, a person, a practice, uh, an item, a relationship, anything you could think of, big or small. One thing in your life that you have right now that's part of your life that you feel gives you or supports your need for autonomy. One thing that supports your need for autonomy. So 
for me, like it's Google Calendar. I use my Google Calendar. It makes me feel control in control of my life. <laughs> right. If Google decided to stop making Google Calendar, I don't know exactly what I would do. I would probably cry. So what's one thing that you that's in your life that makes you feel free, agentic, in control? What's one thing in your life that makes you feel competent? Do you play a musical instrument? Are you a really good cook? Is it your professional life? What's one thing? And then relatedness. Could be a person, could be a community, could be a sport. And then when you write these three down, take a second and just notice outside of the framework that we just talked about, notice how do these three things in my life that I have do or practice, how do they make me feel? Like in my body, how do they make me feel physically, emotionally? Do they make me feel calm? excited, at peace, happy. Just tune into, tap into that feeling for just a moment. Give it some time to kind of breathe and marinate. <laughs> I know, conflating metaphors, sorry. Okay. So now, We've tapped into what in our life supports our psychological needs and how that feels to really tune in to that support, right? What that feels like. Now you're gonna choose somebody close to you. And I'd like you to pick someone that you have a, a dear relationship with, okay? Friend, family member, romantic partner, someone you're close to, mentor, venti. And then I want you to write their name down. So write their name on your piece of paper so you see it. And this helps connect us to the person that we're reflecting on, kind of pivoting away from ourselves and what we just did to this person. So write down their name. And then imagine what in their life fulfills the three psychological needs. What do you think? And it's an imagination exercise, right? So you don't have to get it right. You don't have to pick the top three things, but just knowing them and who they are and kind of how they show up in the world, their constellation of traits and personality characteristics, preferences. What do you think in their life supports their three psychological needs? And then notice in, now again in yourself, what does it feel like to think of the other person in this way? To kind of go that extra mile when thinking about them and tuning in to their universal psychological needs, the same needs that you share, the same needs that we all share. What does it feel like to think of someone else in the context of enlivening them and lifting them up and contributing to their, their psychological needs? What does that feel like? Because that's what we're doing when we contribute to their psychological needs. We're enlivening them, even if they're not around, we're tuning into what that feels like, right? And I would imagine the next time you're in a conversation with that person, or maybe I wouldn't imagine, maybe that's presumptuous. I encourage you the next time you're in a conversation with that person to draw to mind those psychological needs and draw to mind what you wrote down on your piece of paper and see if that changes or pivots or just maybe even shifts how you show up in that conversation. And see if that maybe shifts just a little bit how they respond to you, how they respond to the interaction. And then notice, I'm giving you a lot of things to notice, and then notice how you feel in that interaction. So a couple of things I wanna leave you with in terms of this. Um, it's important to remember that you don't have to get these right for the other person. We don't always know the specifics of what makes people tick, right? We're all different, we're all human, we're all you know, beautiful and diverse. But what we all do share is these three psychological needs, even if how we go about fulfilling them is unique, okay? 
And so what I also want you to notice is that just by doing this activity, it helps us tune into other people's. It starts by tuning into the fact that they have these three psycho psychological needs and then making it a priority to listen and communicate in a way that support and supports and uplifts them. And then the last, very last thing I'll say here is that um, generosity in this way is beneficial for the giver and for the receiver. And I'm not gonna get this quote exactly right, but the Dalai Lama says that if you're going to be selfish, be wisely selfish and be compassionate because giving compassion comes right back at us and fills us up, contributing to our own sense of self-worth, self-compassion and self-esteem. And that's why generous listening works the way that it does. Okay, that's all I have for today and I will open it up to questions. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sophia, thank you so much. This has been such a wonderful presentation. It's always a pleasure to hear you speak and to share your theories and ideas. And I really appreciate how you blend theory with practical application that people can you know, take right away and use in their next conversation. And I also really appreciate that you um, allow people to give themselves a break. You know, it's not perfect, it's a practice. And so when we're trying these new skills, we don't need to come into it already being perfect. We can practice, and in fact, we probably will practice for the rest of our lives, right? So yeah. thank you so much for that. Um, and I'll ask Jackie if there are any questions or comments from the chat, and then I'll open it up to the rest of my team. Uh, we do have a, a comment from Sarah saying that she teaches nurses and she's loving the language around this logistically, um, helping others to feel seen. Um, and I did encourage her to share this session with them um, as much as, as possible. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Sophia, it's wonderful to see you and uh, to see also to just see and listen to how your thinking has continued to emerge and, and grow deeper. So thank you for sharing that with us. I also love the, the idea of works in progress and sort of giving us a chance to preview what will come out as scholarly material later. So thank you. Yeah. Just also curious about this, um, the words around generous listening. I think that that is such a beautiful way to frame the practice as you've, you've taught it. And so just wondering, you know, did, was that something that you found? Was that something that you created? How did you come up with that, that term? So I was teaching conflict communication um, at ASU, it's upper division communication course. And the, I noticed that the kind of highest level of listening was empathic listening. That's where listening tended to stop or our theor theories about listening tended to stop. And empathic listening is wonderful. It's so, so important, right? Listening, putting yourself in the shoes of other people. But what I also noticed through um, just my research and interviewing people and, and um, doing some of this work is that when we try to empathize, we end up oftentimes over-relating and pivoting the conversation back to us. So it's like, oh, oh, I, I, I'm so sorry you've been through that. I've totally been there. Something similar happened to me. You know, that's the tendency, right? Or, oh my gosh, that's so amazing that that thing happened to you. You know, that, that same thing happened to my friend. So we tend to, and it's because it's natural, we tend to pull the conversation back to ourselves when we're trying to empathize. So to sort of move out of that tendency, um, generous listening takes us away from that habit and and it and and the tendency to do that where the theory sort of started emerging for me and this is just how my scholarship tends to go is through several research projects um i did a, a research project like five years ago i'm actually revitalizing it now but where i interviewed people who were particularly charismatic so i went around and i asked my network do you know anybody who's the most charismatic person you know and someone would say, or I'd talk about my research and someone would say, oh my gosh, I know so-and-so, you have to talk to them. I've never met anyone as charismatic as they are. And so I went around, this is what I did, right? For six months, just interviewing these super charisma people. And what I found in that study, and this will be coming out in scholarly research uh, later on or soon, hopefully, 
But what I found is that we tend to, in society, metaphorize charisma as a gift, like something people have, the X factor, you know, they're born with it. It's like something they possess or something they are. But these super charismatic individuals that I was interviewing, they actually made sense of and metaphorized their charisma as the act of giving. That's how they talked about it. Not something they have, but something they gave. It's not something they are, but something they did. It went from a noun to a verb. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. That kind of flips this idea of, you know, the, the super charismatic, you know, superhuman person, big personality, it flips that on its head a little bit. Um, so that's kind of where the seeds of this framework um, got started. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much. And I also just, so many things I appreciate about you. And one is that you can see what isn't there. And so identifying that as a gap is really, uh, it's a great uh, scholarly quality. So also just uh, a noticing that you know, generous listening is uh, is kind of, kind of love in action. And this is something that we all can do regardless of our, our financial background or our cultural background or where we live in the world. This is something that all of us can, can practice, which I also just really appreciate that you don't need to have any certain things, material things or resources in order to do this. Thank you so much, Sophia. I always appreciate your wisdom and um, always learn so much, so thank you. Um, one question I have um, is around conflict. So I think conflict arises when these psychological needs um, are being compromised by either a situation or a person. Um, so I'm wondering, can and if so, how uh, would you apply this practice uh, in times of conflict? Um, more so if maybe you're the one feeling hurt, um, mm -hmm. how can you still practice gener generous listening and try to um, generate peace or a solution around conflict? That's a big question. <laughs> you don't have to have the answer right now. <laughs> I think that it's, it's, it's important to be able to feel safe in a conflict situation. So, is, so that's number one, if you don't feel safe and whether that's emotionally, physically, you know, um, relationally, spiritually, then you're probably, I, I wouldn't recommend engaging in um, this type of listening. I would recommend probably, and I'm not a conflict counselor. I, you know, I've taught the classes, but conflict communication classes, but I would recommend not kind of giving yourself in this way because um, that probably wouldn't be very healthy. But if it's, you know, your kind of run of the mill day-to-day -day conflicts, like with your relational partner or roommates or friends or boss or coworkers, you know, kind of just like the, you know, the inconvenient conflicts that we all, you know, face in our day-to-day, -day, then this type of listening can actually diffuse conflict because most of the time people don't feel heard. We listen from an evaluative state. And when we listen from an evaluative state, we're basically, and we've all been here, you'll totally resonate with this. Um, not you, Hannah, but just people in general, all of us. When we listen from an evaluative state, we're listening to and waiting for them to get done with what they're saying so we can just jump in with our point, right? What we're saying. And this, that can't happen. That doesn't coexist with generous listening. You can't do both. You can't listen in a evaluative, defense, defensive, protective way and listen generously. And so when we listen generously and we're able to kind of come over that obstacle of our, our own defensive and protective mechanisms, which we all have, okay, we all have, but we're able to move past them and listen generously, our, the, the, our other person you know, that we're in the conversation with very well could feel heard, finally, right? Finally heard and then diffuse the situation. But you don't wanna sacrifice your own psychological, physical, mental, emotional safety to do that. So it's context specific, but yeah, that's what I would say. Dr. Town, we have two more questions from the chat. Um, the first one is not a question, but it's from Sarah. She says, no questions, just gratitude. I took many great notes. Thank you for shining a big light on this practice. Evelyn says, thank you, thank you, thank you. This has been so helpful and great food for mind and soul. Um, Emmanuel says, can we practice generous listening also to ourselves as a sort of self-compassion or is it counterproductive for the absence of the other? 
Oh, I think you absolutely can um, listen generously to yourself. And, and I love that, Emmanuel. Like I hadn't thought about that yet, hadn't gotten there yet with this. And I think that's probably incredibly re revitalizing in moments of stress and uncertainty. If we can tell ourselves, you've done this before, I know you can do this again, you know, or I'm with you, <laughs> you know, like almost self-compassion, right? You know, um, telling ourselves, I'm saying you, but I mean me, you know, I'm important and my choices matter. I've done it before. I can get through this hardship again. You know, my wisest self, my highest self is with me during this process. I think we can self-reflect. I think that's, I love it. I think that's really wise. So thanks for that, that question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Evelyn uh, also has a question. She says, I love the way you frame and develop ways of listening. Do you think the types of listening ever overlap? Yeah, probably. Most communication patterns and behaviors have some porosity to them. You could listen informationally until something piques your interest, right? And then you laugh, right? So those, I guess that's not really overlapping. That's more like a break in the listening style, but I could imagine listening that overlaps. Um, there's some that would be very hard to overlap, like evaluative and generous listening, which would be very challenging to have those coexist in one place or in one person at the same time. Um, but I could see overlapping probably, pivoting definitely. We can definitely pivot, yeah, quickly too. Thank you for those answers. And thank you everyone on the chat for those questions and comments. Um, and Sophia, it's always so wonderful to see you. And I think that the way that you frame this in the very beginning, talking about an epidemic of loneliness and how we can support ourselves and each other uh, through this generous listening is really a skill set that we'll need to use over and over again in the coming months and years. So thank you so much for being here. Um, if anybody has questions for Dr. Town, you can reach out to us and we'll uh, let her know mindfulness at asu.edu. And we have a couple of sessions coming up this week, tomorrow, Wednesday, uh, Jason Lolly will be talking about bullying and he will be sharing with us uh, information from his book. Community Wellbeing is Thursday as always. So if you have questions, comments, topics for discussion or anything else that you'd like to hear more about either in the coming month or for our summer session, then let us know. Please let us know. We're really open to feedback and to topic suggestions and ideas. So everybody, it's, it's been a great session. Thank you again. Um, in the meantime, stay safe, stay connected, take care of yourselves and each other.